We are reading from the book of Hebrews, first four chapter verses of chapter one and chapter two, five through twelve. Uh, this passage is echoed in uh, a sometimes almost verbatim terms uh, from the first chapter of Colossians, uh, the first chapter and part all the way through the third chapter really of the Gospel of John, but certainly the prologue to John's Gospel. And then a call again in Philippians 2, which will be our uh, confession of faith. And in a nutshell, I think it is God so loved the world that He gave His only Son that whoever believes in Him may not perish but have eternal life. But let's see how the writer of Hebrews uh, voices this theme of the great condescension of God and glorification of the Lord as a consequence of that coming down to us and suffering. Verse 1, long ago, God spoke to our ancestors in many and various ways by the prophets. But in these last days, He has spoken to us by a Son, whom He appointed heir of all things, through whom He also created the worlds. He is the reflection of God's glory and the exact imprint of God's very being. He sustains all things by His powerful Word. When He had made purification for sins, He sat down at the right hand of the majesty of the mind, having become as much superior to angels as the name He has inherited is more excellent than theirs. <coughs> now, uh, in... Chapter 2, verse 5 and following. Now God did not subject the coming world about which we are speaking to angels. But someone has testified somewhere, actually Psalm 8, but there was no numbering of chapters when this was written. Psalm 8, if you're interested. Someone has said somewhere, what are human beings that you are mindful of them? Are mortals that you care for them? You have made them for a little while lower than the angels. And you have crowned them with glory and honor, subjecting all things under their feet. Now in subjecting all things to them, God left nothing outside their control. As it is, we do not yet see everything in subjection to them. Them is us, by the way. But we do see Jesus who for a little while was made lower than the angels, now crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. It was fitting that God, for whom and through whom all things exist, in bringing many children to glory, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For the one who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one Father. For this reason, Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters, saying, I will proclaim your name to my brothers and sisters in the midst of the congregation. I will praise you. It's significant that this last quote is from Psalm 22, which begins with the words, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Which connects God's suffering, Jesus' suffering on the cross with our communion as brothers and sisters with Christ in God. I have a memory I want to share has to do with Melinda, who you never met. But you will. 
We threw her ashes into Puget Sound, giving her remains into the vast Pacific in which she had been baptized 40 years earlier when she was 18 years old. Into the ocean of God's love, into the embrace of the Almighty, whose love is far deeper than the Mar Mariana Trench, that stretches out to touch the shorelines of every continent, every people, and every person, and every nation. The overwhelming love of God, which led me to a hymn that I believe some of you may know. And I have it here somewhere. Yeah. And uh, I'm going to risk it. I think if I started this, the choir could actually chime in, and I wouldn't be concerned if you did. <laughs> in fact, if you would want to cover me up, that's <laughs> It's a hymn that we have not sung because it's not in our hymnals. And uh, it, its tune is sometimes avoided because it's rather dirge like. Whatever that means. But it is also a truly great expression of the love of God. Oh, the deep, deep love of Jesus, vast, unmeasured, boundless, free, rolling as a mighty ocean in his fullness That's John. 
And that word, through whom everything was created, became flesh and dwelt among us and gave himself for us, laid down his life, suffered for us. This is the, the same theme that uh, we've just read about. The sun, who is the sun? The reflection of God's glory. Now what is the value of the suffering of the Son of God? The value is in the condescension of the Son of God. It's who Jesus is and how far God in Him has come to become one of us who was no sin, who had no sin, to become sin for us, to bear our sinfulness, that which we had to redeem. My friends, if salvation of that was humanly possible, Jesus wouldn't have to be divine to start with. And if salvation through the suffering of God the Son were possible without the Incarnation, then Jesus wouldn't have to be fully human. It is in that reality of the condescension of God Himself in the person of the Son, so that when Jesus speaks, when Jesus acts, when Jesus reveals God, He's not revealing about God, He's revealing God Himself, because the Father and I are one. That is not a human accomplishment. That uh, the, the Pharisees, when he, Jesus claimed divinity openly, condemned Him rightly, it, because they understood that He was a human claiming divinity, which is the ultimate blasphemy. Not understanding or appreciating that in fulfillment of Scripture, he was in fact divinity claiming humanity for himself. The exact opposite of fulfillment. So, in Colossians, Paul writes in this elevated, some people think it's a hymn. It may be, but majestic words. He, Jesus, is the image, the image, of the invisible God. He is the firstborn of all creation. What do you mean by that, Paul? What do you mean he's the firstborn of all creation? He means the first creature? This is what I mean, says Paul. Paul elaborates, he goes on and he explains. For, because, why is he the firstborn? Because in him all things in heaven and earth were created. All things. Things visible and invisible were the thrones and dominions and rulers and powers. All things have been created, and this is the clincher, through him and for him. No, he is not a creature. This is what uh, the author of the Hebrews is combating, the notion that it must be of the best angel. It's the Arian heresy, the Neo-Arian heresy. We persist with this forever. But you don't need to know that. It's not a theological class. What you need to know is he is... God. Now, Jesus, what is the gospel? Jesus is Lord. I am that I am. Incarnate as one of us, fully human, fully divine, embracing us into the relationship with God that He has Himself as human. He Himself is before all things. In the beginning was the Word. With God, the Word was God. He Himself is before all things, before all creation. And in Him, all things continue forever to hold together until God chooses to loose it through Him. So, now, continuing, when we're still asking the question, what does it mean to be the firstborn of all creation? He is the head of the body, the church. He's the Creator, and He is the Lord of the church. Here, amazingly, the whole creation of the universe is compared on an equal level with the creation of the body of Christ. That's significant. My friends, when the universe has evaporated and gone away, or whatever happens to the universe, we will still be here, or wherever we are, we will still be. God has created us for eternity and redeemed us in Christ for that purpose. Uh, the meaning of eternity, well, long time. <laughs> you can just rest in that one. May not perish, but have eternal life. For in Him, 
all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. He is the head of the body of the church. He is the beginning. Now, the second use of the word firstborn. The firstborn from the dead. The firstborn of creation, I take it in this context, is fulfilled in that becoming a creature, he is the firstborn from the dead. In other words, he is the beginning of new creation. He is the firstborn of the old creation, the firstborn of the new creation, firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. This is the continuation of creation into redemption. Thus, you can't separate the creation of the universe and the creation of us in the image of God from the redemption of us as a people and as individuals for the kingdom of God. And through him, God was pleased to reconcile to himself, reconciliation, all things, whether in earth or heaven, making peace through the blood of the cross. So our redemption is part of the larger redemption of the whole of creation in the death of Christ. How shall I express that more? So, how much are you loved? What is my only comfort in life and in death? And that I belong, that I belong in life and in death, body and soul, not to myself, but to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ, who at the cost of his own blood has fully paid for all my sins and has completely freed me from the dominion of the devil. That he protects me so well that without the will of my Father in heaven, not a hair can fall from my head. Indeed, that everything must fit his purpose for my salvation. Therefore, by his Holy Spirit, he also assures me of eternal life and makes me wholeheartedly willing and ready from now on to live for him. Okay. Now you can sway in your minds, I'm not going to ask the ask Presbyterians to actually get up this way. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of 